now because I am, you mentioned a nap, and I, I'd really like to have a nap, so I'm feeling a little, a little punchy. <laughs> Well, we've been we've been at it. I was here early today too, so we've been at it kind of all day, just yep. clearing up some things. Cause I'm off mm -hmm. to New York, oh, New I'm York so on Thursday. Yeah. Um, you gonna see any shows or anything? No, nobody will see shows. No, what? Am nobody I... that you're going with likes Broadway, really, right? Just well, you. just me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, we, I have been told that we are going to some kind of concert. Okay. Um, in Brooklyn, to which my response was, oh God, what do I wear? And my <laughs> New Yorker friend responded, it's New York City, everyone wears rags. <laughs> and then I Very think, expensive rags. I think, I think then, she, then she said something like, no one will be looking at us, don't worry. Oh my, okay. I feel like it's going to be some performance art. It one. looked like performance art, and I listened to the music, I'm like, this music sounds so cool, what, how... How am I going to, what do you, I only know how to rags. go. I rags. just wear my rags and, and wear, absorb Wear your rags and have some pizza. I, I don't even know. It was so cool that I couldn't even stand it. Um, and then apparently, and then on Saturday we're going to see a comedy show, which that is totally my jam, so mm -hmm. I am into that. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah, did that. I went whole... to Caroline's Comedy Club once years and years ago, and I didn't like the comedian. Yeah, I mean, it was all right. It was more about the experience, quite frankly, than yeah. than the actual... Yeah, thing. watching comedy now is like, that's what we do if we go to my parents' house um, for dinner. Like, we always used to watch a movie or something like that, and now we always put on comedy. My dad will kind of um, pop up whatever new comedy special he's seen on Netflix and share it with us, and we laugh. We laugh, we laugh, we laugh, and we laugh. laugh. Well, this is a comedy podcast. It is. It is. It <laughs> should be, like, there should be no. a special category no. for business comedy. Business comedy. That is funny. Except <laughs> that we're the only ones, really, who think we're funny. Yeah. That's 100% true. Yeah. yeah. 100% um, true. My friend Belinda always says to me, let somebody else tell you you're funny. <laughs> you think you're funny? I do. Let somebody else tell you you're That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. She, Belinda Thanks. might be very funny. Belinda is very funny. <laughs> yeah. Let somebody else tell you, Belinda. So, episode five of this season. Episode five. And for our new listeners or viewers, we are breaking down Brene Brown's book called Dare to Lead, which was published last year. And um, in it, she talks about how leadership in next year, in 2020 and beyond, requires people to be courageous and have difficult conversations so that they can really get to the heart of what's going on with their teams and build effective teams and engage teams. And then in order to do that, we have to be courageous, we have to be vulnerable, et cetera. Et cetera. And, we, and so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. Or my father would say, or even so fifth. <laughs> yeah, because he's funny. He's funny. <laughs> or what? I don't, I don't know about you. We'll let, we'll <laughs> let, let, else tell you we'll let someone else tell you that you're funny. <laughs> um... So one of the things that we've been talking about is that um, we have different views when we read the book. Uh, yeah. Normally, like everybody would we're have We're rumbling views, with the book. But we're rumbling. Like I am, I've been reading it and rumbling with some stuff that I'm, I'm going through and you've been rumbling with it, not to put words in your mouth, but I think you've been rumbling with it because it's, it's resonating, but it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's alarming to me. So I, because I am resonating so hard with so many of the concepts and some of the concepts are stuff that we teach with different framing or different language around it. So I'm all about it. Yeah. Um, and then occasionally I just get like a, I feel like I'm having like a short circuit. I like think... I just can't get past a certain point because, you know, I still don't feel shame. Therefore, <laughs> I may be a psych sociopath. Well, yeah, I don't think you're a sociopath. No. But the thing is that um, while many of the concepts in the book are not new to us because we teach it, yeah. The framework is. The framework and the language and yeah. how it's how it's presented and the context within it's presented is just very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's to say, I still love it. Mm -hmm. And from the perspective of someone who's been um, learning and teaching about leadership and communication and all this stuff all the time, this is very refreshing. Mm -hmm. I like being able to rumble with it because... If it just was presented in the same old language that we're always used to, we could just go read our own blogs. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, it would be boring, right? It would yeah. be boring to just read that same language over and over. So I am very refreshed by this language, mm-hmm. and I think the fact that we're rumbling with it is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. I think so too. Um, and I think that's what's giving a greater meat, meat, greater, content. greater content, greater relevance relevance, greater influence on, yeah. on this work. I think it just gives, it makes me want to give Brene more, more Queen, Queen Brene vibes. Well, this section might add even more to that. It did for me. Yeah. My mom, in, back in the seventies, my mom took her master's degree in health education and we were living in New York. And, um, I remember she decided to go back to school and my sisters were older than I am, and they were off at university. So it was just me and my dad at home. And my mom, would, we were just outside New York City, and my mom would get on the train or drive up to Albany. And uh, she went to university there and did health, um, her master's in health. And, long story, that was really long. <sighs> um, one of her courses was values clarification. Mm-hmm. Now, this was the 70s. Do you remember Forrest Gump? Yes. When he has the t-shirt and he discovers the t-shirt with the smile face on it, that smile face logo was so 70s. And this whole, my mom, during the 70s, values clarification was seen to be <coughs> so hippy-dippy. And it was all about, you know, um, determining what your values were and then not just hiding them away, but actually living your values and and saying what was important to you, but demonstrate. And that was all yeah. deemed to be bullshit. It was <laughs> hippy dippy bullshit. My, I remember my mother uh, was thinking it was really good and she tried to work it into her some of her courses. And she always said to me, Ruthie, if you can't say it out loud, it's not your value. It's not a value yeah. that's important to you. You need to be able to say it out loud for it to be. And I never forgot that. Until, and then when I read this and read this section, we're doing section two, by the way, which starts on page 185. I just was like, wow. Yeah. And it's interesting because we've often taught um, organizations, you know, that it's so important that the only way that you can get people, as I often say, on the bus with you and to your destination is by all being connected to the same um, set of values, the same mission, the same vision, all of that stuff. And so, you know, every time you mention to someone, well, you know, what's your organization's mission, vision, and values, they're going to roll their eyes and say, I don't know, check that page of her website. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I truly believe, maybe more so in smaller or um, more organic organizations and less so maybe in like big bureaucratic organizations, those values can really read something, mean something. Yeah. I reread hours on our website the other day and I was like, yeah, those still stand true and those are what we believe in and how we conduct our work and how we I do it. I believe it is as well. I don't know if you will recall back in one of the first episodes, Brene talks about how people need to be able to measure and quantify the behaviors that create, that mean you're a good leader. And that a lot of times today there is no measurement. There is no, somebody might just say, here's a soft skill. And yeah, are you influential? Do you coach people? Blah, blah, blah. But there's no hard, fast behavior. Well, this chapter is where, and I always thought, well, how are you going to do that, Brene? This is the chapter where she does it. So she starts by helping us define our values, then take a look at the behaviors that support those values, and then turn them into measurable things that you could, on a performance discussion, actually talk about. I love it. Um, page 185 is where this starts. And I wanted to read the a little bit from the first quote. And because in this book, Brene refers a lot to the arena. She says, who's going to be in the arena with you? In other words, who's going to be rumbling with things? Who's going to um, throw off their armor of that prevents them from having difficult conversations? Who's going to get in there and do the hard work with you? And she says, the arena, particularly during dark and hard moments when we're trying to be really brave, can be confusing and overwhelming. Distractions, noise, a rapidly blinking exit sign that promises relief from discomfort, and the cynics are in the stands. In those tough matches when the critics are being extra loud and rowdy, it's easy to start hustling 
or to prove, perfect, perform, and please. And then she says, we can either hustle to show the crowd that we deserve to be there, or we can let them scare us off. Either way, it's easy to let them get in our head and hijack our efforts. So I loved that because what she's saying is, um, if we aren't being true to our values, we're not staying in the arena and doing the hard work. And all these people are watching us in the arena. Remember in one of those other chapters that talked about people who are happy to throw criticism at you, but won't get in there with you and help you. Those people who are watching and hurling insults, it's a lot easier to just quickly hustle and please them than it is to stay true to who you are. I think that this is still recording while my screen goes to sleep. This is going to be a real pain if we have to do this all the time. Um, we are using a different computer and I did not set, don't go to sleep settings. <clears throat> so anyway, in this, she says um, that the problem is that a lot of those companies that do have values, it's actual BS. She says it's BS. Oh my gosh, they put it out there because it sounds good. HR wrote it and HR said this it. is what you're going to do. And so she says there's three steps to creating values. And the first one is to name them. And she says um, there's these activities where people take a huge list of like 100 values and then you pick your 15 that represent you. And one of the things I loved was that she quoted Jim Collins, you know, the book From Good to Great, which is a great, great book. Um, she, he said, if you have more than three priorities, you have no priorities. Oh, so, which is like everything we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. And she says, if you have more than two values, you have no values. You have no, didn't go quite that far, but yeah. she, it's too many. How do you know what you tether your behavior to? Yeah. So you can't make it. If, when I always say that a values in an organization or should be how you make decisions. Mm -hmm. So if you value honesty, then when a decision comes up where honesty is at stake, you just choose honesty no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and so when there's 15 of them, how do you... How do you do that? How do you matrix that all together? It's impossible. Well, she called them second tier, core and second tier. So on page um, 188. And apparently online because... Oh, yeah? Yeah, in the because I'm listening to the audio book. She definitely oh. said that this list of values is available online okay. so that you can print it off. So whether okay. you have the book or are listening to online or are just cheat reading it with us... Um, Go download, go download it's that list of values. a list of values, and there's space to write your own if, you know, something's not two. there. Yeah, <sighs> and so apparently people complain. I can't just pick two, blah, 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 blah. Okay. There we go. On page 188, with all of these lists, she and people saying, I need to say 15. She goes, okay, then go pick 15. Go pick 15, put a little check mark it, and then pick two of those. <laughs> I like that strategy. Yeah, me too, and I, I did it. Because it was hard. It's a little over overwhelming. I didn't. I went straight to two. You'll see and, I put mine with black dots. Oh, all right. And and the uh, the interesting thing is she said that the second tier, so the other 13, so you circle two and put check marks next to the other 13. The other 13 she called second tier, and they are enabled by the core. Yes, I did like how she explained genius. that. It was genius. It's a great way of getting people who are unable to. So tell me about your two. All you right. wrote connection and fun. Connection and fun, which sounded so lame to no, me. Doesn't and sound. I was annoyed by that those were my mm -hmm. values, but I couldn't I, I couldn't pick anything else. I mean, I think there was a couple other ones mm -hmm. like um, efficiency or simplicity that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, I had to, I had to go with those two. And I realized connection for me was all about, um, connecting with people and connecting people with other people and, um, connecting with people when I train, um, letting other people, teaching other people to connect with other people. Um, it was all about wanting to be connected in a, mm -hmm. in a tight way with, Mm -hmm. with people. And I, I think then that also extended to like being curious, like being curious and me wanting to help other people. Like that's like something that's very important to me. I get great joy from helping other people. Yeah. Yeah. What about fun? Fun was just like at the end of the day, if you're not having fun or it can't be fun or you can't make it lighthearted. And I think this is how I even eked it into being simple and 
Mm-hmm. You know, for everything, for everything that, that, that fun for me was paramount that if you weren't having fun while you were working, if you weren't having fun while you're having conversations, if you aren't able to take things and turn them in a way that, um, makes them, um, makes them not so much of a burden. I feel like there's so much negative talk all the time. I think that for me was like that positive energy and and fun was important for me. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, (laughs) I had honesty and kindness. And then when I was talking to you last week, you said, you know, integrity is one of your core before we talked about Mm -hmm. those traits. And I thought integrity is probably a better one. And honesty could be a subset to integrity for sure. Um, Because it is very important to me when people do what they say they're going to do, when people do the right thing, even when no one is looking, uh, all it's, it is important to me Mm -hmm. and I want my actions and I want our company's actions to represent that. And the kindness piece is just, it's, it's the, the layer of everything that we do certainly at work. And what I try to do, I'm more successful some days than others. But what we try to do, what I try to do rather, even here, there's, uh, I know people who really struggle with connecting with, with one particular person and they're really quite hard on this person. And I, I have to be careful that I don't sound like a, you know, a minister or something and saying, well, perhaps, you know, but I feel like I have to, because this person's not a bad person. They just have issues with social boundaries. So anyway. Um, I thought that was really, really interesting because if you look at all the other things I put next to it, generosity, respect, you know, understanding that all could come under kindness, um, making a difference, authenticity, responsibility could all come under integrity. So oh, it's the sun I'm trying to figure out where that sun, sun is sun. coming from, what it's hitting. Oh, it might be hitting something behind us. Yeah. No, I don't know. It's all right. Um, anyway, I thought that was really interesting to, cause to be able to actually do that work for an organization, I think is important. And I think it's incredibly important for a leader because what if your values are different than someone on your team? It's fine. They probably will be, but is that part of any clashes that are happening? Yeah. I mean, it's sometimes I know, and you and I, if you and I are at disagreement to something, it's often because you have a strong, a very strong values-based kind of a, yeah. this is how you see it and this yeah. is right and this is wrong. And you always stand by that mm-hmm. um, judgment. You don't kind of falter it or, uh, you know, make it work for everyone. Um, whereas I um, am often from the connection side looking at people and thinking like, well, what's possibly going on yeah. and why are they thinking that way and how are they behaving that way? Um, is it possible that it's this or that or this, the other, right? And that can sometimes put us at conflict because you've got the rigid and I'm like, well, let's... Yeah, and uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because it's like taking kindness, how far do you take it? Yeah, right? So, and this goes into the next step. And this, what you're seeing on the screen is the actual sun on your sweater. Look, look down at your sweater. It's coming, it's from behind the corner of the computer. Yeah, but I think it's it's coming off the corner of the computer, and that's the reflection. This reflection on this piece uh, of sun right here is going yeah, out there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so in step two, that's when it's take, looking at behaviors that support the value. So she says, what are three behaviors that support your value? So if I was using kindness, for instance, um, the three behaviors I was able to come up with was one, always making the most charitable assumption. So the guy who cuts you off on the freeway, maybe his wife is having a baby and he's trying to get to the hospital. Um, I also put down practicing the platinum rule, which we also teach. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know, you're probably familiar with the golden rule, which is do unto others as um, you would have done to you. The platinum rule is do unto others as they would like to be treated. So treat others the way they want to be treated because we have now such a better grasp of diversity and understanding that not everybody wants the same thing you do, that trying to treat others the way you want to be treated, it's a, it's kind, you're doing it from kindness, but even more, it's trying to figure out what they would like. That's my second behavior. And then my third one is doing things for people without expecting anything in return. Oh, 
And that is a very mm -hmm. tough one for me. So she talks about this and then she says, take those three now and flip them and come up with slippery things that are outside that value, slippery behaviors. And so first one for me is being charitable with people I like mm. and only people I like. Mm. It's a lot easier to go, well, maybe she just doesn't have any social boundaries or maybe he's late for the hospital. But if I don't know you, I might be more likely to go, what a jerk, right? It's, yeah. it's a lot yeah. easier yeah. for me to be charitable with people I like. So that's a slip, slippery behavior that is outside of my value. And then the next one is practicing outside the practicing the platinum rule is the golden rule. I'm being kind to you because I would really like it if you did this. So therefore, I'm going to do it to you. And it's, it's the easy way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third one is when I do things for people without expecting anything in return, stopping the kindness if I don't get anything back is also a thing for me. Mm. And I get that from way back when I was younger when um, I remember we moved and my, my parents were just around the same age I am now. And they were trying to get in, get into a new community and they kept having dinner parties and doing stuff and nobody was inviting them back. And it was just because other people had, it was like getting into a clique at this age, communities are well established and whatever. And my mom was just like, well, then I'm done. And I have found myself doing that. I stopped inviting people over for dinner for that reason. Yeah. I used to have, you used to remember, I used to have dinner parties all the time. Yes. I used to take great care in a really fancy, intricate meal mm -hmm. um, and never got those invites back. Someone did at once point out to me that they thought that it was very difficult for them to, um, um, to reciprocate because they felt like they couldn't match your dinners, match my dinners. And it's things like if you go outside, let's say in the winter, sometimes people will shovel your neighbor's walk. And if the neighbor never shovels yours, do you stop shoveling it? Is that kind? It's, you know, and these all seem like really far out there and oh come on Ruth you don't have to shovel it every time or whatever but it's it's little examples and if we were to apply that to work what would that look like very interesting like, what would that look like for you for instance for connection what would behaviors both the good ones and the slippery ones look like for you I struggled with a little bit of the slippery ones on connection but mm -hmm. maybe it'll it'll come to me um I know for connection it was about um helping like the, it's like behavior of wanting to help others yeah. um, as a means by which to forge <laughs> connection. Yes. I always said, my sister-in-law said, oh, I feel bad because I've asked you for two favors in a row. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, you should know me by now. I love doing favors for people. It makes me feel really good. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel honored that someone's willing to ask me for something tough. Mm -hmm. I um, mean, she was like, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. Okay. <laughs> and she kind of just, she's like, uh, whatever, anyhow. Um, but that is probably for sure. So something about helping people. Um, I also really enjoy um, connecting other people in order you're to help very other people. Good. You're a connector. I just love hearing yeah. someone say like they're having this challenge <laughs> and me being able to say like, I know someone who can help you or mm -hmm. I know someone who did this. I know someone you could talk to and putting them together. I mean, I don't know if though those people actually like doing that post-connection bit, but I like making that connection happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had kind of genuine curiosity as part of my mm -hmm. connection piece that mm -hmm. um, in trying to like establish these connections and relationships that I'm, you know, always trying to be genuinely curious and ask lots of questions mm -hmm. to really understand what, mm -hmm. what makes people tick. Definitely. Um, and I think probably now that you've said your slippery ones, I could probably say that Yes, I too become resentful if I help, I help, I help, I help, I help, and then no one does the same for me. Yeah, so it's like keeping score. Keeping score, right? Or that connect, 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 but no one connects or does right. that same thing for me. Right. So I do tend to build some resentment of those things at some point. Right. Um, so that is something I need to watch out for. Mm -hmm. um, for the fun, um, it was kind of behaviors like... Uh, being easygoing and, uh, you know, letting things slide and being open and optimistic. Um, and then those similarly kind of can go into slippery slopes if, um, if I can then be perceived as kind of flippant or yes, 
right? Like when does that, what's that line for me when yeah. things go from easy not going and fun? Not yeah, not everything's yeah. fun and not everything's <laughs> positive and I don't ever want to be that person that's like, but look on the bright side because... That's hard. You you know, it's it's interesting because um, last week you called me and you said, I just need to vent. All I want to hear is, yes, Nicole, that's awful, Nicole, or something like that, right? Because you were clear up front what you needed and because you didn't want the, look on the bright side, Nicole. <laughs> Yeah, I think I yeah, and I think what I was asking for is like I need to vent and I recognize that some of these are stupid or selfish or this or that. Um I just <laughs> <laughs> isn't that funny? Um <laughs> I just needed to I just wanted to say them and I didn't want a solution, right? Like it's like that thing they typically say about like the difference between men and women, right? Women want to talk something out and talk through it and, and yes. get some empathy and men want to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So if I, you know, complain, do the same complaints to my husband, he'd just say, well, just don't do that. Mm -hmm. Just don't feel that way. Yes. Just, just don't talk to that person. That. Just stop doing that. And I didn't want that. I was like, just want someone to listen to my venting right now because <laughs> I'm frustrated and then I'll be okay. Oh my goodness. That's funny. Um, so yeah, so the first, like, obviously the first step is the naming the values. The second one is understanding the behaviors that support it and the behaviors that take away from it. And then the third thing she says is, um, again, approaching things with empathy and compassion. So this is where she talks a lot about the arena and who's in the arena. So I think people should read this section on their own. But it's, it's about who are all the people that are there? Who are you behaving for? Are you behaving for the people who are just throwing... Um, shame at you or who are just being critical, um, who are making you compare yourself to other people? Are you acting mm. out of that one? So she says, shame, who do you think you are? Scarcity, there's never enough time and attention for me, so I'm going to do something to create more attention and time for me. Mm. Um, or uh, comparison, look how everyone else is doing things so much better. I better hustle so that I'm doing things as well as you are, instead of sticking with my values. Um, mm. She says, box seats are, pri the box seats in your arena are privileged. If we are, um, the people who built the arena, she said, are those who built it to house people that look like them, behave like them, uh, have the same race, sexual orientation, all that. That's who's in the arena. Everybody's like you. Um, and are you able to understand that in order to truly connect and understand and have empathy and compassion for people, you need to know what it's like to be outside the arena entirely. And we talked about that last time yeah. where um, people say, well, how do I ask about it or how do I talk about it? And she said, first you listen. Yeah. And you know, so there's a lot of work there. And, uh, <coughs> and she said, the people that we want to have in the arena that we are acting for, are people um, who have empathy for us, they support us and they support our values and the self-compassion that we have for ourselves. So there's a whole section on um, that on page 195 are who are the people that have the seats in your arena? Who are you acting for? And I think as an organization at a big level, at a high level, and as a leader, um, you, it's worth thinking about that. Yeah. And who are you acting for? There's also a checklist on page 198 that takes this further and it has, um, I'm not going to go through it, but there's 10 statements that are a readiness checklist for giving feedback. I loved these. Oh, do you want to go through it? I thought they were just really neat. I thought they were, sure. um, we can go through it quickly. I, like there was a couple of things that one was, um, uh, about, uh, sitting next to instead of across from someone. Mm -hmm. I found that very impactful. So like when you need to have a tough conversation, are you, um, creating an adversarial moment by sitting yes. across from them or are you creating a conversation a by sitting a connection by sitting next to someone so that's See? probably why that yeah that's um, the first one I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to sit next to you rather than across from you I, I thought that was just yeah. great and so then you know like here I'll go, yeah go, I'll, you go through I'll take a couple the of ones them that you liked um because there's a lot of them and uh, we do talk a lot about difficult conversations and giving feedback oh. and I think we should refer back to this at some point, maybe even make a checklist or something. I thought this was because amazing for training on genius. feedback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to listen, ask questions. And here's the mind blower, except that I may not fully understand the issue. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Every time we want to give feedback to someone, if we could just start with saying, 
and I may not fully understand what's happening yes. here. I'd like to offer you some feedback. This frustrated Help me. Help me understand. Help me understand. Like, I just... It seems like this. Is that right? Am I seeing it correctly? A hundred percent. Um, I like this for, uh, those managers that really like to kind of nitpick that, that perfectionism. Yes. Um, I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to acknowledge that you do well instead of just picking apart your mistakes. Mm. So mm. being able to come up with both of those, um, I'm, ah, uh, I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm open to owning my part. Yes. That is, that's gotta be. That should be number one, right? We all have a role in it, you know, and I, I would say 99% of the time we have a role. Either we didn't create the right environment. We weren't clear enough. We didn't support it. We don't know about a sideways look that we gave someone. We just don't know. Yeah. And I think that's always uh, been one of my, um, maybe one of my values as an employee mm -hmm. had always been to quickly admit when I was wrong or admit that I had fault in said process instead of deflecting to mm -hmm. a million other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what helped me um, become, you know, a successful leader and to do those things later on was because yeah. I, mean, I was able to do think that. Think about a manager, the best intentioned, great manager with somebody who's failed, who's on their team and who didn't deliver, or did, delivered poorly. You could take it back so many levels and find out at the end of the day that person wasn't set up for success. You as a manager didn't ensure they had the right training. You didn't check in with them as much as they needed to be checked in with, not how much you wanted to check in with them. 100%. You didn't set them up with a buddy. You didn't do whatever it was. But like this is my number one pet peeve when giving feedback to other people. Like the second someone is not willing to own up to any part of it, yeah, I, I really lose a lot of respect. Um, in those kinds of scenarios, because I've always made it an important part to say like, hey, I may have had a part in this and I'm willing to own up to that. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do to get to move forward? For right. Sure. I think that's oh, maybe that's like a big part of my values is like always wanting to move to resolution. Right. Like and get there over struggling and well, you're rumbling willing to, forever. You're willing to rumble and negotiate, not negotiate, but to. Not just put it out there and draw the line in the sand, but to understand that line is blurry and to, to figure out how to erase the line, really. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing about one of them was that the problem is be is in front of us, not between us. There's another went time when I know I'm ready to give feedback, when there's yeah. a problem here, not creating a wall here. I love it. So I think those are my big favorites. Like I think there's, like, of all of, Re of, all of Brene's very long lists yeah. of more than three items... Um, there's, there's, those are probably my favorite, but there's a lot in there that I think are just really, really good and apply to different people when they're, they're giving feedback. Well, and she also said giving feedback is tricky or, um, she talked about, uh, receiving feedback that it's tricky because we, the skill of the person giving us the feedback might not be great. So here we are, let's say we're, you know, well, Brene talked about it was her getting feedback from someone. She's yeah. pretty good. I imagine she has skills. Yeah. Um, and the things are that you're caught off guard because somebody giving her feedback wasn't trained, didn't know what they were doing, and they couldn't, like, uh, she talks about a customer or a client who said, this is crap. Like, that's the feedback she got. Right. So poorly given, caught her off guard was the second one, yeah. and didn't know the intention of what they were saying. So there were three things. And then she said, how do our core values um, enable us to receive feedback? So you just talked about that yeah. with you. The connection piece and yeah. wanting to resolve it means that if somebody gives you feedback, after a little bit of a, you know, you're able to then move immediately into, okay, help me understand. Yeah. Yeah, I loved her concept of a man a mantra mm -hmm. uh, when you're receiving. Like, I love mantras, first of all, I think. Mm -hmm. Not from the yoga namaste perspective. <laughs> um, I'm often teaching someone. Uh, it's probably the number one advice my friends come to me for. Is they're like, I have to have this conversation or I have to do this or I have to say this. And, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to respond. And I always say that one of your best tactics is to have a mantra. And I mm -hmm. use this story all the time. Mm -hmm. I'd gotten into a fight with my husband before a party. We arrived late because we were fighting. And when I got there, 
uh, the hostess said, oh, you're finally here. What happened? Mm. Um, and, you know, I just kept saying, you know, I had a rough afternoon, but I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, but what happened? And I just had this idea in that moment. If I can just keep repeating my mantra, hopefully people will just drop it and not make me admit that I had a fight with my husband mm -hmm. or make me lie and say like what I normally would say, which is like, my, my oh, hair dryer was like, it's exploded. The car broke down. Right? Yeah. Like silly stuff like that. I was like, this allows <laughs> me to be truthful and honest, yeah. you know, without having to explain myself and embarrass myself or have to, you know, admit that I got in a fight. I mean, who doesn't? But anyhow. Mm -hmm. And so it went on with all these other people. They were like, oh, we thought you were never going to make it. You know, it was a rough afternoon. I'm so happy to be here now. And again, people would press, what happened? It was just a tough afternoon. I'm so happy to be here. And I've never, it was like a, a lesson I taught myself. Yes. I've never forgot that lesson. Um, and I've often shared that with other people, right? When they didn't want to elaborate or get into something. And so I loved um Brene's mantra when, you know, she's getting feedback. I may not agree, but there's something of value yes. out of this for me. You said that about some, I was about to say some piece of crap feedback. <laughs> <laughs> feedback we got on a proposal that was not accepted. Yeah. And you said, okay, it is kind of crappy feedback. There could be something we could learn in here. Yeah. So whenever we get that kind of feedback, yeah. the, the mental shift, and that, that's kind of what I think about it as it's, in, I mean, because the easiest response is that feedback is stupid. They're stupid. They didn't pick us. They're so stupid. We didn't want it anyway. They're so stupid. We don't even want that anyways, yeah. right? Rationalize yeah. yourself out yeah. of out of the feedback. Um, and I've always been able to say, you know what? I don't know how helpful that feedback was. Or I don't know if I, you know, one of the things is sometimes you don't agree with the feedback that someone's giving you. Right. And I've always thought the best perspective on that, especially for me, was, you know what? Um, I never thought about it that way and I, I, I didn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I agree, but there has to be something said for perspective that if your perspective is that way, or if you felt there could have been more in the section that I thought was longer than all the other sections, there must be something to that. Yeah. And you're doing that again from the connection piece. You're even in that moment trying to connect to the words, to the intent, to the person giving it to you. Yeah. When I react to that kind of stuff. I'll do it from the, well, the right thing to do is to listen. <coughs> the right thing to do is to take the, the feedback. The, and, the right or wrong. The Yes. Yeah. 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 And I'm often thinking of it from the, you know what? It's not easy to give feedback. They're probably not trained in giving feedback. Maybe their decision was a bit arbitrary. Maybe, maybe, maybe they can't even say. The maybe person wasn't they even... talk to, it's not yeah. even them. They get the piece of paper. Um, well... Yeah, you know, so here in this two. section, it could have been more or better, and you're like, more, yeah. better, what? Yeah. Right? But at the end of the day, you say, okay, for future proposals, maybe we should put just beef this up a little bit more. And mm -hmm. if that helps us win another proposal, then we're, we're all winning. Mm -hmm. Right? So I love this idea of having a mantra in the back of your head that says, I may not agree with this feedback, but I have to admit that there is some value somewhere in it. Yep. Um, and it might even just be the value of the experience of having the conversation. Um, I cannot, cannot stress that enough. Yeah, she goes on from this section uh, when she, just before she winds it up. She says, the whole point of having the values um, is to ensure that all your behaviors align with it. And whether it's you as a person or, what the heck, um, or, you know, you as an organization, are your behaviors, the, the projects that you're taking on, the conversations that you're having, the people, whatever, do they align with your values or not? And so when you go back and look at ours, it's great to know that it still is what we do. Um, and she says as well, when you share what those values are for other people, it allows you to build connections and understanding. And she tells this story of somebody she's known forever. And she went through this exercise with them and found out that finances is one or financial accountability or something like that is one of his core values. And she just was a gog and her like had to pick her jaw up with both hands and understood why he was always picking at the, at the numbers. Made me want to go back and go, can I have third one? <laughs> I feel like I'm like that too. Um, so yeah, 
So the last section in this part is on page 210, and she then says, um, now we've got our values, we know what it is we're trying to do, um, and how do we hold people accountable? So this is the part where she operationalizes it, and she uh, creates behaviors for each value that people are then held accountable to. And this is, this is the thing. So um, she has, uh, it starts on page 210, and this just this last section, it's quite short, but this last section is what boundaries are in place um, so that you can make sure that you've, um, you're living your actual values and you can measure them. You've got all these behaviors that are set down um, and you, you're measuring things like, what did she say? Oh, um, she called it living big. You take your values, you have the behaviors, and what about the other things like um, we always have to have positive intent. How do you measure that, mm. right? Or uh, we always have to have integrity. We always have to be generous. How do you measure that? So the whole thing that she says is she ended up with what boundaries need to be in place for me to be um, uh, have integrity and be generous with my assumptions about everyone else. So anyway, if there's this whole thing and she just goes through like um, what that means to be brave. So her organization is be brave, serve the work and take good care. How do you measure that? Well, in her company, being brave is I set clear boundaries with others. I lean into difficult conversations, meetings and decisions, and I talk to people and not about them. So you ought to be able to have good conversations about that. Yeah, That's a great set of boundaries yes. and probably one like that we could recommend in a million different organizations mm -hmm. with toxic cultures. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, she says, serving the work is about stewardship. The behaviors are, I take responsibility for our communities and consumers' experience. I am responsible for the energy I bring to situations, so I work to stay positive. I take ownership of adapting to the fast pace of this environment. Those are all absolute things that you could talk to in a performance conversation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, she says, you can see how this process takes lofty and subjective values and makes them real and accountable or actionable. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. I wonder what that would look like for our values. Mm. We'd have to, I wonder if that might be a little exercise we yeah. might do yeah. as part of this week. Um, and maybe we can share that on our social media, kind of what, what are our values and yeah, how to, how, how do we align that. with them? Yeah. I, I literally just looked at them the other day, uh, because Ruth yeah. had so very kindly redone yeah. our website and, yeah. um, made up. some changes. One of them is execute flawlessly. All right, here they are. Perfectionism. We have, we have seven values. Well, far too many. So maybe one of our tasks might be to create two and then Ooh. have some yeah, supporting some values. So yeah. execute flawlessly, building lasting relationships, having fun. Shocking. I'm pretty sure I must have put that in there. <laughs> uh, making things simple, staying ahead of the curve, surprise and delight, and operating with integrity. Isn't that funny? That is such a mix of the two of us. Totally. Such a mix of totally. the two of us. It really, really is. So, um, and if I were to like even start, um, making some changes, I would mm -hmm. say execute flawlessly. Like, I think that's not that we don't obviously work with quality and, but I don't think executing to perfection is our value. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. It isn't because the whole thing that we've even learned, we're three quarters of the way through this book is that perfectionism is something that creates. A terrible environment. Yeah, we, we don't want that, nor no. nor is there a perfect solution. I mean, it's kind of like that uh, client we were talking to the other day, and I said, there is no exact answer for this. It's coaching. Like, yes. there is no perfect answer. It's trial and error and practice and learning. Mm -hmm. So I would take that out. Um, you, gosh. Right? I mean, maybe surprise and delight again. Like I think, well, if, that's sort if of you're part building, of make fun. If you're having fun. fun and you're building good relationships, I'm sure you're surprising and yeah. delighting. Yeah. Um, stay ahead of the curve. I mean, it's it's something we we try to do. We yeah. try to do, but yeah. I can't say it's like one of our 100 well, percent operational values. So what you'd do is, if whatever you select there, you'd say, what are the behaviors that we would measure for staying ahead of the curve? 
We attend regular training. Yeah. We look for opportunities to do something new. We speak to new clients and find out what they want and then operationalize that. Yeah. You know, so each of these, if they are values, we need to then write down what behaviors support it, what behaviors are slippery, and what are the measurable behaviors that I love we it. could do at the end of every year. I think if it's helpful uh, for our listeners and our, our readers or Brene's readers, um, yes. We can do this as a bit of an example and share with you yeah. how we've rumbled with our yeah. previous seven values or yeah. more than seven um, and got down to two with a bit more clarity. Yeah. And I think that's why I wanted to sort of fly through the um, feedback section because it's so much part of other podcasts that we've done, yeah, other work. True. And when you talk about um, actually operationalizing what the values are, and then we even, I didn't even think to look at ours, our own. And now I'm looking at it and going, yeah, how do we, how do we do that? It's, they make sense what's there. Makes total sense based on what we just talked about. Yeah. But what could we do? So I think that's kind of a cool one. Um, so that is that section. And the next section is part three, Braving Trust. And it starts on page 221. And it goes to, it's very short, 238. It's only 17 pages. Um, so that'll be, um, next week. So that we'll do that one next week. We will. Yeah. And I'm catching up on some blogs as well that summarize things, but I do like the idea of, you know, when we should do this when we do our annual review in December. Yeah. We should, part of that should be looking at our values, pick whittling the list down and then picking some it. measurable behaviors. That we can talk about, did we do that this year, and can we put them in place for next year? Love it. Thanks, Brene. Love it. Thanks, Brene. Call yes. us. Call I'm us. Still waiting for that call because I may be a sociopath. <sighs> no, so, so. All right. Thanks, everybody. Until next time. Bye. Bye. -bye.